Hello everyone! Well guys, I'm sorry to tell you, but the inevitable has happened. I have been scammed, deceived by a shitty Kickstarter. But before we get into that, let's take a look at another robot, shall we? Now this one's important, you see, because it might be a signal of like a mass migration of shitty robots that are going from Indiegogo to Kickstarter. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because it's just like all those shitty robots that we saw on Indiegogo. It promised us to do all the same damn things that those ones promised to do. Hi, I am Makai, the first personalized family robot. I can fit your unique requirements. It tells you the weather, it wakes up your kids, it pleasures your wife. You know, everything you can't do around the house, this thing will do. Simply say what your needs are. Big Eye will understand your requirements, then adapt corresponding skills to satisfy them. Yeah, lady, I'm thinking the same damn thing. Look at that, that's so fake! Everybody knows that the PS4 has that stupid light in the front that doesn't turn off when you're playing games. But don't worry, I'm sure that's the only fake device in that whole damn video. It's time to eat! Hey, that's pretty cool! This shitty robot project is on Kickstarter instead of Indiegogo, but they kept the bad dubbing. Good on them, I was feeling homesick for a while. I like it when they include that, because that should be like a red flag that goes off in your head telling you that they probably live in a jurisdiction where you can't get your money back. With Big Eye, the possibilities are endless. Uh, no. You see, Big Eye is very limited. Extremely limited, because he doesn't have any fucking arms. The only limit is your imagination. That is such a lie. If there is something else that Big Eye can do, they would put it in the pitch video. That's why it's there. The reason they tell you the possibilities are unlimited is because they want your money. That's it. Whatever is keeping you from backing, the one feature that you want that they didn't show in the pitch video, they want to be able to tell you the Big Eye can do it. Therefore, the greatest pitch video for Big Eye isn't even the one you just saw. It's the one that exists in the backer's fucking head. The one where Big Eye is running the whole damn house and taking care of the dog and the kids and the kitchen, everything. Being so much more functional than a trash can mounted on a Roomba. Some of the features they talk about in the campaign are really strange. They say that Big Eye can be a newsreader, and I guess that's pretty helpful. I could see how somebody would request something like that. But no, you would be just as mistaken as I was. From what I can tell, it's not a text-to-speech thing. It doesn't give you the current events. Instead, Big Eye reads the news. Literally. Big Eye is a news reader. Okay, uh, thanks, I guess? And you might be saying, well, dude, maybe it reads the newspaper and then says it out loud to you. But if I live in a fully connected household where everything is electronic, where everything can be accessed by my robot, what fucking chance is there that I still get the newspaper delivered to my door? And remember, Big Eye doesn't have any arms. How is he going to turn the pages? It's fucking useless! Now, as you guys can see, Big Eye is a very complex machine. So I had to call in my mentor again, uh, Dr. Ob Vias. You've heard of him before. He, of course, has tenure over at the Nashit University. The good doctor and I looked at this project, and we came to a startling conclusion. We figured out that robots don't need to blink. Seriously, why does this robot need to blink? There's no functional purpose to that. I see that as a major alarm bell for any project. Creators on crowdfunding sites are beggars. They cannot afford to waste their money on stupid shit. And getting a robot to blink is pretty fucking stupid. When they start including stuff like that, they're just messing with you. They want you to believe that the project is further along than it actually is. If the project is that far along where you finish development on the blinking mechanic, why don't you just put it on store shelves? Why you even need Kickstarter? Maybe because it's not fucking working the way that it should be. Right now, these robot projects are cash grabs. It really is a tax on the stupid. And this one collected over $190,000 from 176 people. Yes, the average backer pledged over $1,000 to this campaign. I'm anxious to see what they get, and for their good, I'm hoping it's not just a blink and a blank stare. But enough of that, let's move on to the main course. Today, I have a very strange project to share with you. And yes, I know that all the projects we cover are pretty strange, but this one, this one is special. You see, I kind of think that projects exist on, like, different levels of absurdity. Like, for instance, one reason a project could be absurd is because it's just an outright scam. They're trying to sell you technology that just doesn't exist, and will probably never exist in our lifetime. And then there's another level where it does use existing technology, or something close to it, something that they can achieve with just a little bit of R&D. But then it becomes absurd when the idea around it is just stupid, or it's part of some predatory scheme, or they're misrepresenting what their product can actually do. And we see that happen all the time. It's probably the most common type of project that we cover. But the last category is also the rarest, and that's where it gets really special. That is when we have an idea that is so absurd, so outrageously impossible, that I have trouble believing that the pitch is even real. 
The thinking behind it is so obviously flawed that you have to wonder, how does a creator even function in normal society? It becomes so outrageous that you start to wonder if this is like a graduate level sociology experiment, and our responses are being collected and they'll be formed into a thesis statement. And today we're going to look at a project that fits into that category. So let's check out Gamer Archive. Oh nice, it's been rated by the Cool Stuff Association of America. Because of course that's what a sane person starts their pitch video with. And it's rated C, which you would think stands for cucumber, as in cool as a cucumber. But no, the C apparently stands for can't wait, for extreme fun, for endless adventure, and for never ending good times. What if I told you you could access any video game ever made anytime? And then what if I told you that you could store those games in multiple ways, including on a device the size of a credit card? I'd say someone found out what a ROM is. From the initial creation of the medium, video games have only been played on specific devices that they were created to be played on. And that has pretty much remained the same for decades. Well, we're about to change history. Alright guys, I'm going to try not to stop this video too many times because a lot of it just doesn't make any sense. But this is one of those pitch videos that kind of drifts further away from reality the further you get into it. So don't worry, I'm just going to roll up all of his bad ideas and kind of tackle it at the end. But already, you can kind of tell what his complaint is and what he wants the solution to be. He wants to make an all-in-one system that does everything. And nope, I am not exaggerating there, just keep watching. Introducing Gamer Archive. Gamer Archive is a gaming console that gives you the ability to play games from the past, present, and future in HD on all TVs with an HDMI input. Depending on the game, that means 720, 1080i, 1080p, and 4K. Gamer Archive is also a living, breathing library for video games. In short, as licenses and clearances allow, Gamer Archive will give you access to any video game title from any maker, anytime, anywhere. You can play any game from any maker as licenses allow. So what if, say, everyone shuts the door on him? Well, then you get no games, from no game makers, at no time, and nowhere. The Gamer Archive universe includes the Gamer Archive console, Gamer Archive asterisk controllers. All right, hold up. What the fuck is going on with those controllers? Now do you guys see why I have such a hard time taking this project seriously? Seriously, how do you use that fucking thing? It doesn't really have like any hand grip support. So I guess you hold it on the sides kind of like a frisbee, and then maybe point your thumbs down to reach those analog sticks. And then it has a Sony D-pad. And then up top you've got one of those like roll-on deodorant things. I don't know, maybe this is the controller that you use to play Californication. Gamer Archive Keeper Cards. Okay, Game Spring Zone? You know what, fuck it, I'm not even gonna ask. I already told you guys, this thing makes less sense the further we get in. Gamer Archive Expansion Books. Gamer Archive Smartphone Apps. And MyGamerArchive.com. This guy really loves his Gamer Archive. He also appears to like film, but we'll get into that later. And MyGamerArchive.com. Hello. I'm Gary Nance. Okay, what the fuck? The guy was a sugar cookie the whole time? Am I high? Alright, I refuse to believe that that's what the guy looks like. The guy probably looks like this. So you guys know I don't modify these pitch videos, but I'm going to make an exception here and just swap these images, alright? Founder and CEO of Inception International Industries and the creator of Gamer Archive. The simplest way to look at Gamer Archive is to consider companies like Netflix, HBO, Showtime, and other content distribution platforms. These companies are not unlike DVD and Blu-ray players. They are portals. Ways to watch and enjoy movies and TV shows made by an endless list of production companies like Fox, Universal, Warner Brothers, and Sony. Ah, games as movies. Again, we're going to come back to this. This is exactly what Gamer Archive is. Access to video games. From classic to contemporary titles, from every video game company that has ever produced video games, to any company or person that ever will. All playable all of the time. Okay, this is where it's confusing. I guess Gamer Archive isn't the name of the console, it's the name of the service. Key features of the Gamer Archive system include saving to and playing games on Gamer Archive Keeper cards, saving to and playing games on traditional CDs, DVDs, and Blu-ray. Alright, there's some awkward parts to his pitch where it kind of sounds like a PowerPoint presentation, but that's because he actually had one stroke of genius. You see, his whole video pitch Everything that you're hearing right now, it's just a reading of the pitch that you wrote. Pretty clever, that's two birds with one stone. Playing games directly on MyGamerArchive.com Saving to and playing games on the Gamer Cloud 
saving to and playing games on a Gamer Archive expansion book. Once you own your own Gamer Archive console, you can participate in a never-before-seen service that MyGamerArchive.com will offer. This service gives Gamer Archive console owners the ability to send their cartridge games from any game system via traditional shipping methods to MyGamerArchive.com. MyGamerArchive.com will transfer those titles onto your MyGamerArchive.com account for download onto your Gamer Archive console. After the process is complete, MyGamerArchive.com will return your cartridges to you. Aha, uh -huh. so you're going to get physical media, convert it into digital, and then stream it onto your devices. Oh yeah, I'm sure that's not going to be a problem at all. Please join our campaign as we bring Gamer Archive to the world, and be among the first to discover the power to choose, and the convenience of any time. And that's just what I did. He didn't reach his very modest goal of $26.5 million, but I'll have you know one of those $6 was mine. I even tried to help him out. I wrote in the comments, I believe in this project, but why is the goal 26.5 million? Why not 27 million? I worry because I feel it is the reason why so many people hesitate to back your project. 26 is a multiple of 13, which is an unlucky number. A lot of Chinese hotels even eliminate the 13th floor and instead use it for utilities or those little pods that Japanese people sleep in. Look it up. I think you should ask Kickstarter if they will allow you to change the goal to 27 million. That should eliminate the bad luck we're experiencing. Well, until we get to 13 or 26 million, those will be hard numbers to overcome. And you know what? He even responded to me and said that he would check with Kickstarter. So you see guys, I did my part to help out this project. In fact, I'm proud to say that I am the only subscriber to his YouTube channel. You guys didn't do your part and that's why we failed. Well, actually no, it didn't fail, he cancelled it. For undisclosed reasons, which I'm sure were completely unrelated to the lack of a working prototype. But he still got back to me and told me that he would relaunch the campaign. But it turns out that was nothing but lies and deceit! Where's the campaign, Gary? Why am I not playing any game ever made any time, Gary? Okay, yeah guys, I was totally fucking with him. But did he actually take that comment seriously? If he fell for that comment, then that alone is evidence that this project is in trouble. He seems to be very new to the idea of Kickstarter, and that's fascinating because this is like a project that you would have seen years ago before they ever had any prototyping requirements. People will just go to Kickstarter with all kinds of crazy ideas like this. So where do we start with this one? I really don't know. There's just so much wrong with it, where do we begin? We could fairly assume that the Gamer Archive is just going to be an emulation box. And he keeps saying they'll play any game ever made, but that's impossible. Emulators are not perfect. It's actually a pretty big accomplishment when an emulator can get to 100% compatibility with a game console's library. So playing any game ever made is a pretty lofty ambition, and again, we're just assuming that he's going to use emulation, he doesn't even specify in the video. And also remember that I was pointing out that he seems to be a film buff. You don't have to think too hard to understand that he's trying to copy the Netflix formula. But movies, games, and even music are totally different media. For music and film, they work great across different formats. For instance, I could get a Blu-ray disc and transfer that onto 35mm film. It's not going to have the same quality, but it will be the same film and you could still enjoy it. Same thing with music, I could get a vinyl record and put that on digital mp3 and it's still the same song. Games don't work the same way though, except for maybe Doom, which they get to work on everything. I'm pretty sure you could play Doom on a sewing machine at this point. But generally, I can't get something like Grand Theft Auto V and make it work on a Commodore 64. Consoles are closed, proprietary boxes that by design do not work with each other. So unless you have many different emulators with a very high degree of compatibility, you're not going to be able to play every game anytime. But you know what, for the sake of argument, let's assume that he was able to get every game to run on his console. He still has the problem of getting licenses to stream them. He covers his ass with the words as licenses permit, so he does understand to some degree. But I still don't think he would understand how hard it would actually be to get all those licenses. Would $26.5 million cover that? Would it even cover the licensing fees for the last generation of consoles? And then of course you have the problem where he says, send in your games and I'll upload and stream them for you. Which is just so wrong that I'm not even going to waste any time on it. If he doesn't understand how making money off a digital copy of something he doesn't own is just wrong, then I can't help him. But you know, I think that says a lot about him and his business practices. All of his pitch is just really about using other people's work. He really just wants to sit back and make money off of licenses. I mean, really, where in the pitch do you ever say that he's going to be working on the Gamer Archive itself, as in, like, making the software or the hardware or whatever the hell goes in it? He's just an idea man. And to further illustrate this point, let's take a look at his other businesses. He has an idea for Made in the USA licenses. Because, of course, I'm sure that he's the one who came up with that term, and so he wants to sell it now. So yeah, he wants to sell the right to put the words Made in the USA on a product. 
And even postage stamps with Made in the USA on them, which makes absolutely no fucking sense. Unless it's supposed to mean Mailed in the USA. But by far his strangest website is BalloonBuddy.com, which on the actual site he incorrectly has it down as BalloonBuddy.net. From what I gather, this is some sort of a tube that you use to tie balloons. That's it, that's all it is. And the Balloon Buddy is such a runaway hit, you can even get t-shirts and hats. He also trademarked the phrase, no matter the size, they have to be tied. Oh, and you're also going to notice that the website has like this weird formatting thing going on, but that's not me, that is how the website actually looks. And at this point, I'd like to remind you, this is the same guy who wants to make a magic streaming box that plays any video game ever made, anytime. Hey, that voice actually works! I'm going to use that voice from now on! So, you see guys, MyGamerArchive.com is complete bullshit. The man has no expertise to make his dream come true, and he just wants a lot of money. You guys are going to believe anything I say when I talk in this voice. I could tell you a tadpole turns into a butterfly and you'd totally believe me. So, in conclusion, please don't trust any sugar cookies you meet online, no matter how sweet their voice. This video was rated D for douchebag. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.